mother's car driving to the beach on the Gold Coast a long time ago. Who could forget the sound of the engine, the seats, the smell, the song that was playing on the car radio at the time. But what you experienced, what I experienced, wasn't unique. So let me take you on a journey that lasts 100 years. It's the story about the history of Queensland motoring. It's a story that'll take us from bulldust to bitumen and beyond. Horses reigned. Train services were in their infancy when motor vehicles first came to our state. In Queensland, one of the earliest motorised um, vehicles was a motorised cycle that was imported in late 1895 by a German resident. Um, and it was actually trialled. Um, they couldn't trial it straight away because they just didn't, simply didn't have the fuel for it. But it got trialled in um, early 1896 up and down some Brisbane streets. So that was quite a, a spectacle, apparently. Apart from the, the, the cycle enthusiasts, the other early innovators are who I think are really, really important to cars getting um, a bit of a start in Queensland were the coach builders. Well, certain coach builders who are a bit more innovative or looking to the future. Among them, brothers Walter and Thomas Trevithan of Toowoomba. They built one of the state's earliest petrol-driven cars at their Neal Street Coachworks. Its shape borrowed heavily from the brothers' previous work, but horsepower was up a notch. This particular car consists of a wooden chassis made of spotted gum. It has uh, full elliptic springs, front and rear. Most of the, the metal work uh, is directly off a, a salty or a buggy. It has three pedals on the floor. One is a brake, which works on the transmission. The other is the accelerator, and it has a decompression lever so that you can actually crank it. The crank is on the side here. You can turn that over there. The little lever next door is your advance and retard. And the other little lever here is a sprag. Now that drops a bar underneath the car that should you break a chain or can't get up a hill, it sticks the sprag in, stops you rolling back. These new horseless carriages weren't always well received. Well, you're looking at uh, a changing in, changes in technology where you know the horse had ruled supreme for thousands of years. So for some people, this noisy, smelly, and potentially dangerous, and it, was, it wasn't potentially, it was genuinely dangerous, because there was no real ru um, road rules. It was almost a free-for-all uh, in those initial years. Um, yeah, some people certainly did not want this, this new innovation on the streets. Um, and, you know, it scared the horses and um, probably stopped the, the cows milking. It could be pretty tough going, driving on roads that at best were rough-hewn cart tracks and at worst were quagmires. In 1905, a milestone in Queensland history when a group of 12 car owners, many of them prominent local doctors, met at the School of Arts in Brisbane and created the Automobile Club of Queensland. They saw that the future was with motor vehicles and that the needs and interests of motorists would have to be protected. The first run organised by the new club was on Saturday, June the 17th, 1905. Nine vehicles and their proud owners came here to North Quay for a photograph in the shadow of the commissariat stall built by the convicts. They then headed to Hamilton, coming back via Clayfield, off to the southern suburbs, returning to the city. It was a vehicular procession I'm sure looked pretty spectacular, and I think we'll be turning a few heads when we retrace some of that route today. From the outset, the Automobile Club of Queensland campaigned for motorists. It joined similar groups in other states to form the National Road Safety Council and in these early years mounted road signs to help people find their way around. This was a period when cars still only numbered in their hundreds and when 91-year-old Gordon Lee's father, an early vehicle importer, made his first purchase, it was very much a novelty. My dad bought a car, I believe it was a Star, called a Star, and he bought it from a doctor in Adelaide and it was put on a ship and brought to Brisbane and unloaded in Brisbane and Dad had never driven a car but he got instruction from somebody 
and it was loaded onto the wharf and he got in and drove the car. And you didn't have to get a licence to drive a car in those days. On the other side of the world, a fellow called Henry Ford was fulfilling his dream to build cars for the masses. The Ford Motor Company had begun producing its Model T and by 1926, we were assembling them in Brisbane. I think World War I plays another important sort of milestone for the development of motor vehicles in all their guises because the war, I mean, from the early 1900s up to sort of the commencement of World War I, cars were very primitive, so were those early trucks. But the war, the necessities of the war sped up a process of, of te technological development and production that had been totally unheard of up to that point. So everything, transport for land and on the air, literally transformed significantly. On the home front, taxi drivers and members of the ACQ were among those called into service carrying sick and injured soldiers. This patriotic act led to the club being granted its royal prefix in 1921, and the RACQ was born. The war had given many servicemen and women their first experience of driving, and some came back to civilian transport jobs. A car became available for your, your average working family, um, whereas probably those early 1900s, the car was still very much in the domain of the elite um, because they were very expensive things to, to own, maintain, to import. Um, but after that, you know, after World War I, that starts to change. Even the Depression didn't kill motoring and registration numbers barely wavered during those leaner years. By now, Gordon Lee had entered the workforce and had progressed to assistant secretary at RACQ. At the time, RACQ was running motorsports in Queensland and Gordon was a keen competitor. The first of several vehicles he owned was a Morris Minor. Oh, I, I felt really cock of the walk with this beautiful looking, sporting looking car. Endurance races, hill climbs. Gordon had many successes in his motor racing years. But World War II reared its ugly head and he was off to the army. Where World War I didn't have as dramatic a home front impact, initially World War II stifled motoring locally. The war effort meant restrictions were put on everything. My wife had my car through the war and she had an allowance of two gallons of petrol a month for this little MG, which she loved. And, uh, that was the limit that she could do. And also, it had 17-inch tyres that were only made in Britain for that make of vehicle at that time. And th there were none left in Australia, and she couldn't buy one. And one tyre was worn right through to the canvas. And when I saw the car when I came back after the war, it had black insulation tape wound round and round the tyre. Of course, the rationing went on for years, until 1950 it was, yeah. In some ways, the, for that short period, the use of vehicles declines dramatically. At the same time, the war saw, for Australia, the arrival of the Americans with all manner of goods and services, of which a lot of them were trucks and, and you know, the jeep and things like that. The Allied Works Council opened roads, outback and to the Gulf. Disused airfields made ideal motor racing venues. Behind the wheel, things were headed on the right track. A mysterious assault. Visit Redcliffe and be ready for anything. The Rally Bread Lancer to the test today. Don't mind me, I'm just putting the Lancer to the test. <laughs> Featuring the new 2.4 litre Myvec engine with 25% more power, ABS brakes, cruise control, and power windows. Just $29.90. And all backed by Australia's best new car warranty. Put Lancer to the test today. Mitsubishi, better built, better backed. This program brought to you by Snooze. Great savings so you can sleep well. Post-World War II, 
the car had already established itself well and truly as an important part of everyday life in Queensland. Beautiful vehicles like Bryson's 1927 Chandler and the vehicles that are following were already museum pieces. After years of belt tightening, the roads were to be paved with prosperity. And there were changes afoot. The austerity of the Second World War ended. Um, the American, like the consumer goods that suddenly was evident, uh, it transformed society. You know, people now want lots of goods, and part of that is the motor car. A lot of the factories that were sort of geared up for war production now uh, are looking for new markets, and the motor vehicle and trucks and all that, that's what they kick into. We, we become a driving culture very much through that 1950s, 1960s period. We love Stanley, the gorgeous service guy. You can't beat Stanley's service, however hard you try. Yes, we love you, Stanley. Your service is the best. Or you get golden service. Golden service, nothing less. Again, RACQ was a driving force, campaigning about taxation, safety and road conditions. The Pacific Highway from Sydney to Brisbane was completely sealed by 1958, but road infrastructure hadn't fully developed. Driving outback was still a challenge, as Gordon Lee discovered when he relocated his family to Mataburra and set up in transport. I started a garage and having still RACQ very close to my heart and being a member, and having been a member, I think I joined first in 19... 1930, I think it was. And uh, so I offered to do their breakdown service for them, and they listed me as a garage, as an RECQ listed garage. But for times when help wasn't at hand? It was quite common that if you needed to be towed and you didn't have a tow rope, you walked to the nearest fence with your pliers and cut a piece of wire out of the fence and used a piece of heavy fencing wire as a tow rope. And uh, that was quite common. And then you'd go back with another piece of wire and wire it in and strain it and put it up again later once you got fixed up. I had lots of adventures like that. Motorsports by now are attracting a lot of support and the tiny town of Leeburn just outside Toowoomba has a pretty impressive claim to fame. On an abandoned World War II airstrip, Leeburn hosted Queensland's first Australian Grand Prix. Now, every August, the historic Leeburn Sprints invites vintage vehicles and their owners to do laps of the town to commemorate that event. Post-World War II RACQ members continued the charitable works that had earned the club its royal prefix many years before. For instance, RACQ's Sandgate Children's Days were famous and an annual highlight for disadvantaged and disabled children like orphan Jim Graham. About two, three hundred children uh, were all lined up on the day and uh, before that we were taught uh, uh, to uh, sing a song and uh, that was to be done um, before we got into our cars and that. And then all the cars started coming in and uh, two by twos, three by threes, depending on uh, how many children could fit in a vehicle. You had your T-Fords, you had your FJs, you had all the old type cars and uh, beautiful big banner up on this, the front of this truck. They're reading out RACQ, Children's Day, St Vincent's Home, Nudgy. Off the cavalcade would motor, trailing streamers and balloons, arriving for a day by the sea at Sandgate. Food, talk about food. <laughs> never say it. Until that day, I'd never seen uh, fruit. Uh, before, I didn't know what a banana was. Oh, I'll tell you what, when RACQ put, put on a picnic, it was fantastic. The song uh, goes like this. It's RACQ, Children's Day. We are bound for Sandgate Town. In car so gay, we are on our way without a tear or frown. We can smile for a while thanks to you, kind people of the RACQ. There was an enormous cultural shift associated with the dominance of the motor car. I mean, through the, the 50s and the 60s and 70s, you know, the advent of the drive-in cinema, cafes, the shopping centre that we all take for granted, that's, it's all a part of the driving culture where 
You, you drive to this sort of convenient location with the big car park and you can have all the sort of things you want are there. By 1970, most driver's licence holders owned a vehicle. Manufacturers were now offering a range of models and car advertising went full throttle. We love football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. Football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. That's football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. Football and meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. The 80s heralded the era of the freeway. First the South East Freeway, then the Gateway Bridge. With the Gateway Arterial Motorway connecting the Gold and Sunshine Coasts, opened by 1986. Now it was speed, drink driving and the road toll in the spotlight. And the continuing campaign against rising fuel prices. Well, one of the uh, more recent triumphs is to ensure that Queensland motorists uh, benefit from fuel prices uh, that are about 15 or 16 cents less than they would be uh, without the action of the motoring clubs to limit fuel indexation, excise, uh, and also uh, RACQ's action with the state government to ensure that the fuel subsidy remains in Queensland. So that's a major achievement that all Queenslanders are feeling every time they fill their vehicle. The 90s brought the added hazard of driving and mobile phones. We also saw the rise in popularity of the four-wheel drive. We are now one of the most car-hungry populations per capita in the world. Penelope Keith from To The Manor Born in an uproarious comedy of errors. Manslaughter? Based on true events. These women could turn violent. Move over, Thelma and Louise. Here comes Marjorie and Gladys. For the first time on television. Tonight at 8.40 on 7. Cigarette packs use different names, numbers and colours, so they all appear to be different. But what you should know is, light, mild or low-tar cigarettes are not a healthier choice. Because whatever the pack colour, whatever the number, whatever they are called, all cigarettes are toxic and they all cause serious damage. Call Quitline on 131 848, authorised by the Australian Government Canberra. Community. That's something that's hard to find on the Gold Coast. I would have to say it's versatility. It's ten minutes to the beach and close to business areas. Plenty to see and do, lovely shops and cafes. Well, I actually live and work in Varsity Lakes, so I find it very convenient. Varsity Lakes has everything. At Varsity Lakes, the locals agree. One word? Dolphin. For six months a year, the saltwater crook doesn't eat a thing. The only question is, which six months? Get closer, Carumba. Wattle ID repels stains, marks and scuffing. So every little accident simply washes away. Wattle on Australia. Meet the Mannequins. They're set to have a fantastic day of outlet shopping at Harbour Town. With direct savings of up to 60% on quality brands, Mrs. Mannequin isn't hanging around. Yoo-hoo! She's bumped into a friend. Darling, sweetie, my, haven't you lost weight? <coughs> have you heard about Nick? She's given Rick the flick. Say, Mr. Mannequin, what's taken your fancy? Looks like you're getting carried away. Yo, sporty dude, catch this! <laughs> Here comes Miss Mannequin. Doesn't she look excited? The mannequins have shopped themselves to a standstill. What a great day. Oh. Don't just stand there. Come to Harbour Town. It's a day well spent. This summer on Travel Train, grandkids are free. <laughs> so, why not take them? Moving a short distance, Mini Movers is an easy, reliable, quick and safe local moving service where you can control the cost. Call Mini Movers now or get an instant quote at minimovers.com. Mini Movers, your local moving specialists. The property boom might have come and gone, but to the astute investor, this means a great opportunity to be rewarded. Now from award-winning developer the Atkinson Gore Group comes Ilana Aqua, a place where life's richest rewards combine. All Ilana Aqua's luxury three-bedroom apartments are waterfront. 
Waterfront property is finite, so the potential financial rewards are obvious. Call today and reward yourself at Ilana Aqua. In 2006, hold on tight. A massive cyclone is heading for Summer Bay. Someone won't make it through. Rick! The big year of Home and Away starts January 16 on 7. For many Queenslanders, car care doesn't extend much beyond making sure it's serviced, fueled and given the occasional wash. But you'd be absolutely amazed at the number of your neighbours that have a passion for one sort of vehicle or another. They're usually the ones you'll see on the weekend in the driveway with the polishing rag. And nothing quite matches the feeling a car lover has for that first drive. Dare I say, it compares, even coincides, with a first kiss. Car buffs will spend countless hours and countless dollars working on their favourite ride. And if you own one from the 20s, uh, and, you, and one from the 30s, and this one from the 40s, you can see just how different it is, the way they handle, and how every 10 years things have changed. But in fact, by about 1960, they had got everything reasonably sorted out. They'd steer okay and the brakes worked and the gear changes were fairly easy. And since that time, it's just been refinement, but there haven't been huge step forward. This car here is a 1946 Jaguar, as you can see from there, one of four cars that I have. Um, these were an upmarket sort of car in 1946. It would cost you one and three quarter 1948 Holdens to have one of these. But these had 125 horsepower and a Holden would only have 60 horsepower. They had some interesting features even in 46, like a, uh, you could have a radio, AM only of course, um, and it was a valve radio. So when you turned it on, nothing happened. It used to heat up to warm the valves. Real old fashioned technology. English cars um, had quite an interesting approach to toolkits. If you look here, you notice me straining as I lifted that down? It's because there's a lot of weight in this container. This was where they put toolkits. You would be hard pressed to get a lady to lift this up and down. Ken Gurkey's a fellow with grease and oil in his veins, and he's one of hundreds who came forward when the Road Ahead magazine asked RACQ members to reminisce about their first car. Ken's A model Ford was a hand me down from his father. My mum and dad used to play for uh, country dances, and I'd be left to sleep in the car on the back seat while they were in the hall, they'd park it close to the hall until one night somebody threw a cigarette butt on the roof and, and burnt a big hole in the roof, so from then on I wasn't allowed to sleep in the car. I can't remember exactly how long we drove it, probably till about 61, I think, but it was our courting car, <laughs> um, in that we used to drive it to Brisbane to see shows. Old Butte worked her magic and Anne fell in love with the pair of them. Once I got, um, got started going out with Ken, um, my name before we were married just happened to be Ford. And my initial was A, of course, so I was an A Ford too. So that, that led to a few, you know, funny remarks, shall we say. <laughs> Old Butte's still going strong. In fact, the Gurkies are off to Adelaide in her next year. Yeah, I think Anne's got more... Uh, She's got more patience with it than I have because I had some troubles there a couple of years ago and I, I was very upset about why I was playing around with this old rubbish and, <laughs> and, and uh, um, she stuck up for it and said, oh, no, it's have got to keep it going. So then I had to, had to put the money where my mouth was and, and fork up for the parts that we ordered from America for it. Obviously an understanding woman is Anne. Just have a look at what else keeps Ken busy in the garage. Well, this is a 1943 World War II Army Jeep. I, I really got interested in Jeeps uh, in about 82 on a trip to uh, Morton Island in four-wheel drive. But um, the HD Premier, well, uh, we had a HD Premier back in the early days, and um, I decided I'd, uh, I would like a HD Premier again. 
I've got a T-model forward pull to pieces that I must restore. And so I get this. Austin Lancer on the road and the Model T on the road, I'll, I'll have to stop. Uh, maybe a Jeep, maybe another Jeep. Can't help myself. It's motor cars. Get into lots of trouble with my wife, but still and all, it's my passion. Cars are my passion. Josie Cooper can relate both to driving a car that matches your name and having a dad who was passionate about it. Josie's first car was a Mini Cooper, like her father and his father before him. My dad helped me buy it and he paid for it to get um, fixed up. It was a Mini Cooper and um, not long after that he passed away and I used to get um, spooky things happen to it, like in particular my lights always turning on, my headlights. Um, which I thought was him always giving me signs, like before it would break down, because that's usually what happened. It would break down and I'd have to call RACQ so many times. Um, and then on the day that I sold it, which I had to because I was trying to save money to go overseas, um, the man that came to look at it, took it for a test drive, came back and the lights were on again and I asked him whether they'd, he'd put the lights on and he said no. And, I just thought, oh, that was a sign from Dad to say, yep, yeah, this is the guy to sell it to, and it was because he really looked after it. Now, for quirky-looking first cars, you have to give it to Trevor and Ivy Brown. Theirs was a BMW Isetta, a three-wheeler model built in factories lying idle after the war. It was a, ours was a, actually a left-hand drive, which meant Ivy was sitting out in the middle of the road as we were yes. driving, <laughs> <laughs> telling me when it was safe to go around yes. vehicles, wasn't yes. it? We went on honeymoon, innit? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I said to him on the morning, do you think we'll make it there? And he said, oh, yes, yes, we'll make it. And we hadn't gone five miles and we broke down. <laughs> <laughs> when they made the car, they actually put a sunroof in, which they actually sold as a, as a benefit that you got a sunroof in. But actually, it was a safety thing because if you had a front-end accident, you couldn't get out the car because the front door opened forward, so you have to climb out of the roof. We was... paid £68 for it, and we got £70 for it when we sold it. <laughs> so that was the car we did all right on. The only yes. car we've ever made. Yes, <laughs> actually, yes. John Ross didn't pay a penny for his first car, an Austin 7, that he transformed into an MG Roadster. But he cleaned out a farmer's chook house as a trade for the abandoned parts. And I took it home, cleaned up his yard, and did all the things he asked me to and took it home and stripped it down. The bodywork was fairly rusty, so I s stripped it down and I rebuilt a new body on it using uh, bits of metal and uh, hardwood and sheet metal, which I got from the blacksmith next door. I was sh short of uh, only a uh, radiator and a, uh, a fuel tank. And I got uh, sheet metal and I built a fuel tank and uh, I had an ice cream can which held about five gallons. And I put that in the front as I couldn't get a radiator anywhere. And uh, we called it the 50s car. It did uh, built in the 50s. It did uh, 50 miles per gallon, 50 miles an hour and 50 miles before the ice cream can boiled. And it was not very high, not quite three feet high. So uh, it was very small. We nearly ran under a horse one night and the lights weren't real good and the brakes were even worse. But uh, when uh, my wife uh, was about to have a child and there was only two seats in it, we thought it was time to get another one. So we traded it in on a uh, Ford Prefect and uh, I got 125 pounds for that thing. Tony Gonanen started driving early, climbing behind the wheel at age 13 but he'd known his first car all his young life. Bootlace. This 1927 A Model 4 demonstrator had been in the family before Tony claimed ownership in 1948. It was cut down to a utility because in those days, uh, prime producers, farmers, they got more petrol in the rationing years uh, people were rationed and we had little tickets to say that you only had two or three gallons a year, uh, a week, sorry, and that's all you're allowed 
and each time you bought a gallon of petrol, you had to hand your little ticket in. Well, it, it so happened if you cut your truck down, car down to a utility, and being a prime producer, you got an extra two gallons a week. I did a lot of rabbit and uh, trapping rabbits, and uh, I used to put my dogs in the back in the utility, and I just drive everywhere in the paddocks, uphill and downhill, and through flooded creeks, and you know what else? You know, they're just a was just an old bash about vehicling, as far as I was concerned, you know. Bootlace was driven into the ground, but in the 1970s, Tony started restoring her. And since then, the pair have been all over Australia, including an amazing adventure across the Nullarbor to Perth last year. It's uh, 75, 76 years old now, and I'm not far behind it. And I've, I've, um, I'm proud of the fact that I've still got my first car, and I'm going to have my first car until the day I die. This week, the drama is about to explode. Well, you got to call an ambulance, okay? Call Triple O. One of them will face death. One of them will kiss her husband's best friend. She's hiding something. And TV's most twisted love triangle, Exposed. You can't pay me off this time. Headland, Monday to Thursday on 7. Minimum 15% off store wide. For the first time ever, Clark Rubber is taking a minimum 15% off floor stock store wide. Minimum 15% off pools, foam, chemicals, inflatables, mattresses, rubber, and much more. At least 15% off floor stock sale. Two days only and Sunday. Hurry. Home on Super Summer Clearance Sale is on now, and every single tile must go. Floor tiles from 1587 a metre, these 40% off. Tons of tiles, tons of bargains, but you don't have tons of time, so save now. Beaumont Tiles. <laughs> it's easy to update your bedroom at Australia's biggest bedroom sale now in its snooze with up to 30% off all beds and bedroom furniture so you can sleep well you can redeem velocity points on any virgin blue seat you want well almost <laughs> Olympic telecast is brought to you by NRMA Insurance. We're here to help. This summer, Wahoo's got the gear to make it happen. Wahoo flying discs and beach balls. Wahoo surf mats, bodyboards and surfboards. Wahoo volleying, soccer and rugby balls. It's going off. Wahoo beach cricket. Wahoo beach bash. Where would you be without your Wahoo? From the director of Spy Kids comes a 3D adventure on DVD that'll blow you away. Rent or buy The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl in 3D now on DVD. Post-Christmas bargains are so easy at Clive Peters $30 billion stock clearance. Until 5pm Sunday, coffee machines from $69. 1 gig MP3 players from $140. Reverse cycle split air conditioners from $314. Front load washing machines from $599. And 66 centimetre LCD TVs from just $1,599. At Clive Peters, post-Christmas bargains are so easy. Clive Peters, easy. When the founding members of the Queensland Automobile Club took their first jaunt through the streets of Brisbane back in 1905, the suburb of Maruka was already well established, although it wasn't until much later that the Maruka Magic Mile on Ipswich Road became so well known for its lot upon lot of vehicles for sale. According to the Brisbane Courier, on that day in June, one of the nine vehicles participating was compelled to stop. Repairs were made and it completed the run. And the RACQ has been getting vehicles back on the road ever since. The roads could be very daunting if you come from a, a rural location coming to what the big smoke that they would perceive Brisbane as. Uh, yeah, you, you really are daunted. So one of the services the RACQ had were the, uh, the guides that helped 
get them in, into the uh, and around uh, Brisbane. These men and women were called pilots. The first pilots drove motorbikes, which they would hitch to the back of members' cars so they could take over the wheel and drive them into town. Then came drive girls like Rita Hayden. There weren't very many directions to find your way through the city. People used to get hopelessly lost. And at that stage, Water Street had a big open roof and we'd pilot them in into their motel and then take the car to the roof and park it there until they were ready to leave the city and then go and pick them up and take them back out. Exhibition time was very, very busy, hectic, absolutely. You'd drive anything from chooks to dogs to pigs to cattle, anything that came in. I had a um, uh, lady that had some bulldogs that she was putting in the exhibition and she had uh, she had them in the back of the station wagon and it was a terribly hot day and I put one over this shoulder going <laughs> at me and one over this shoulder going <laughs> at me and dribbling and I'm trying to wriggle in the car and all of a sudden she turned and she said, I don't think that lady likes you very much, whatever its name was. <laughs> After 12 and a half years, Rita hung up her driving gloves and took up a job as a telephonist in RACQ's breakdown control centre. We used to just take the jobs on a card, the name and address and... Uh, where the people were and their membership number and so on and send it through on a um, belt up to the uh, supervisor and to whoever it was on and then he'd send it on to the girl on the radio. But of course then it all became computerised and now it's different altogether again. Originally in 1925 there were just two motorbike patrols covering Brisbane. In those days, and it would have been word of mouth, you know, somebody needs assistance or someone saw them on the roads and they stopped to, to help. The early patrols, um, they, one of their instructions was actually to uh, pick up the horseshoes and the bits and pieces on the road to uh, avoid people running over them. From the bike, we, uh, we went to uh, vehicles in the 40s which was the, uh, the Jeep, and uh, then we progressed uh, from that model Jeep up to Land Rover. Uh, we had a few Minis in the 70s, and then uh, we went to uh, Toyota. Uh, this is 1940s, it's a 44 Jeep. We probably put it into service just after the war. So about 45, 46, it would have been doing RACQ work. It was always kept as left-hand drive. They did do some conversions and they did do uh, have uh, right-hand drive ones as well. Uh, good pulling vehicle, excellent for uh, recovery work and bog work, uh, pulling cars out of driveways when they're stuck in driveways, really good. And as an RACQ patrolman for almost nine years before moving into supervisory roles, Albert Budworth saw his fair share of motorists caught in tricky situations. Oh, I think. Probably one of mine would have been, um, was a lady called in that she had a spider in the car. It was a uh, Mazda van. And um, when I got there, all the doors locked up and she's standing on the footpath. And I said, well, you know, can I have the keys to the car? I opened up the sliding door and this poor old spider sort of straddled out and boom, that was it, he was dead. And I said, well, what happened there? She said, well, before I got out, I filled the car up with more teen. There's no need for RACQ in that instance. Welcome to RACQ. This is Chris. Can I start with your registration number, please? And the name of the membership's in? OK, clear. And what's the colour and make of the vehicle? And what was the problem with the vehicle? A flat tyre? These days, the RACQ contact centre operates around the clock on the CAD or computer-aided dispatch system. Calls are received uh, on the 13, 11, 11 line. The consultant takes a request for the breakdown call, uh, inputs the data into our CAD system, and then that data goes through to our service delivery team, and uh, the data um, that they've received is then dispatched out to the patrol or uh, contract service provider in regional areas. We actually, on the, the Mobisys computer here, we have a, uh, it beeps, chimes at you uh, when a job, is a job comes up. Um, once you receive the job, you strike a key and let them know that you're, you're on your way to the job. And then from there, um, you travel You travel to the job. Once you get to the job, you mark yourself as being at scene, so they pretty much know where you are the whole time. Uh, when the job's completed, you sign off on it, and uh, if you're busy, another job pops up. 
The only time a patrol will cut short a job is to rush to the scene of a baby trapped in a vehicle. It's a harrowing but unfortunately regular occurrence and the RACQ team pulls out all stops to come to the rescue. More often than not, it's not the, the kids that are the worry. Most kids sort of settle down after a little while. The main problem is usually the mothers. Some of the mothers are going out of their trees. I've been actually, once I've unlocked the door, I've had a mother completely knock me clean out of the way to get into her baby. But, uh, no, most of the time it's, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, thanks very much. No, you're welcome. Thanks very much. Have a good day. And is the roadside mechanics job any more difficult since vehicles have become more refined? Realistically, cars are still have four wheels, still have internal combustion engines and still have lead-acid batteries, so that side of things doesn't change too much. Um, it's easy to become electronics paranoid or technology paranoid, but not too much has changed. It was a simple plan. Build a pool for half price in two months. But 15 months later... I first thought I'd spend this amount of money. Ah, uh, I would have spent three times that. Finally, he's ready for the big unveiling. If only he can stop the water leaking out. It is too. Hot Property, Sunday, 6.30. To celebrate the return of Holden's Australia Month stock clearance, I'm slaving over a hot plate and bringing top Commodore deals to the table. Like free on-road costs to clear all 05 plated Commodores, including Lumina with over $6,000 of extra value at $32,990. And now, drive away. Come and get it! It's, it's, it's. Dealers must be serving I fill it. Holden means a great deal to Australia. Good morning, I'm Craig from Boost. I'm taking you backstage so you can see the Boosties warming up. Love life, woo! No, guys, life, it's, it's more vibey. Love life, woo! Woo! I, I can't work that. Good day, good day, How you doing, mate? Good, thanks. Last one for you, mate. Terrific. Keeping you busy? Yeah, good. How's your day going? <laughs> Not bad at all. Yours? Yeah, good, thanks. From C.S. Lewis's epic masterpiece, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. Directed by Andrew Adamson. To save time and money, measure twice, cut once. Ryobi Mitosaur, $279. Compressor Framing Gun Kit, $299. Ryobi Angle Grinder Jigsaw Combo, $59. Mitre 10, all the help you need. Australia's biggest stock take sale is on now at Maya. 40% off all full price women's footwear by Easy Steps and Supersoft. 30 to 40% off a great range of clothing from the Miss Shop Department. Hurry, on now. Maya Store Maya. Be tempted by the Summer Temptations meal. Six mini magnums, two pizzas, big dippers and a Pepsi from just $27.95. Three, eight, nine, two, double, one, double, one. An Aussie Casanova makes his move. Tall, Australian, hot. Yeah, mate. But what does he really want from the Ghost Whisperer? Tuesday. Dutton Park Cemetery, once better known as South Brisbane Cemetery. You might think it's a strange place to stop for the fledgling Automobile Club of Queensland on its first one-day outing as a group at the turn of last century. It's the second largest graveyard in the state, but it's on a very pretty stretch of the Brisbane River. Not a bad place to stop for a tea break, if you can overlook the fact that some of our worst criminals, men who face the gallows, were laid to rest here. From death to bringing history back to life. Bulldust to bitumen and beyond the exhibition. It's coming to a town near you. It's a fascinating insight into Queensland's motoring journey. 
To celebrate this year's milestone centenary of service, the RACQ has put together this very special display that tracks the past, present and future of the car in this state. It's been a long time in the planning and a creative team spearheaded by interpretive solutions has been hard at it for months, researching, filmmaking, collecting memorabilia and memories. It's celebrating 100 years of motoring. This isn't just about the RACQ, it's about the, it's about the people of Queensland and the cars, how much the car is part of their everyday life. It is today, it was very early in the 20th century. Well, it's the sort of exhibition where people might spend an hour, they might spend a day. It's a real opportunity over about 150 square metres just to explore traditional museum panels with lovely old black and white photographs and text to go with it. Um, as people expect these days, modern audio-visual devices so that uh, people can dial up a motoring story uh, and in that way meet some tremendous characters. Uh, uh, not just characters because of their relationship with their cars, but just genuine characters in their own right. Um, plenty of artefacts, good old memorabilia. People love old car badges, for example. Plenty of those sorts of things. And I guess if you're going to see a, an exhibition about celebration of motoring, you've got to have the cars as well. So they'll literally see the old and the new, indeed the future of motoring, all in the one exhibition. You know, I think the, the greatest thing as far as I'm concerned is the, is the fabulous people we've met and who have actively contributed to uh, putting this exhibition together by telling us their stories. The free exhibition opened at the Queensland Museum and will remain there until the 19th of June. Then, for the next 18 months, it will travel on the back of a Mack truck, west to centres like Roma and Longreach, back towards the coast. In fact, it'll be on the Gold Coast by Christmas. Then it heads north to Harvey Bay, Rockhampton and up to tropical North Queensland. Out to Mount Isa and back to Maribra by November 2006. The RACQ is a statewide organisation. We've got over a million members throughout Queensland. This is our 100th uh, anniversary gift to them. That excites us tremendously, the fact that we've got an exhibition here that literally all Queenslanders can share in. We're hoping that uh, the local galleries and museums will, in fact, uh, encourage their local residents to make their contributions to local displays. I'm sure we're going to find some great memorabilia that we haven't even discovered yet, but uh, it's, it's an educational experience as well, and so we've gone to some lengths to make sure that there's a... A, an educational resource kit there that teachers can use and uh, take the school kids along and, uh, and learn and have a bit of fun at the same time as well. Isn't that always the way? Wash the car, break the drought. Good evening. There's been a fatal shark attack off North Stradbroke Island. A 15-year-old girl was mauled by a shark late this afternoon. She was airlifted to Brisbane's PA hospital but died soon after. Queensland has recorded one of its highest ever holiday road tolls with 19 people killed. Jetstar passengers who arrived in Brisbane today have lashed out at the airline after their flight from Melbourne was delayed 16 hours. And the Duchess of York has spoken publicly about her efforts to help victims of the Asian tsunami. Showers tomorrow and 29. People's guilty pleasures. I'm coming. I'm coming out. Are about to catch up with them. And you must be the woman who's been screwing my husband. Double Grey's Anatomy, Monday. At Nick Scarley's Red Hot January Sale, save on the Naruma Leather Recliner Package, an unbelievable $19.90. Or the Pier Square Glass Dining Table, an incredible $5.90. During the January Sale at Nick Scarley Furniture, there's a store near you. Holden's Australia Month stock clearance is back on. So it would be un-Australian of me not to invite everyone around for a barbecue. I'm serving up top deals to clear 05 plated Commodores and Rodeos. So help yourself to these and other fantastic Australia Month deals. Come and get it! Dealers must be serving I feel it. Holden means a great deal to Australia.
Here's your chance to see the world's greatest tennis stars in style. Thanks to Garnier, partner of the Australian Open. Purchase any Garnier product from Priceline or Priceline Pharmacy and you and a friend could win VIP tickets to the Australian Open women's and men's finals in Melbourne. This fantastic Garnier prize also includes return airfares, three nights luxury accommodation, spending money and tickets to the Australian Open Ball. Full details are in this week's new idea. Out now. This summer on Travel Train, grandkids are free. <laughs> so, why not take them? Okay, bye, Mum. A mysterious assault. Is someone covering up the truth? Boy! Or is the victim lying? All new Heartbeat, next on 7. This program brought to you by Snooze. Great savings so you can sleep well. It's great to look back at what we have achieved, the club have achieved over the hundred years and so much has moved on since just a handful of people commenced the, the RA, well it wasn't the RACQ then but the Automobile Club and we've been proud throughout of what we have done and of course, the focus now is looking forward to the next years. Where keeping up with motoring innovations alone will be quite a challenge. Motor industry in Australia has come a long way in reference to a few particular vehicles. The luxury market we have here is the uh, Holden Caprice, which uh, has a lot of luxury features, uh, for instance, leather interior, um, proximity sensors on the market, which tell you how far you can reverse to a particular object and how close you are to the front. Other features that we have um, is optional satellite navigation, which tells you where to go uh, in different voices. You can store up to 200 destinations in there. You can go via a particular ATM if you need to, if you're going to a particular shopping centre. Uh, a very, very good feature on on the car today. If the vehicle was stolen, uh, a very, very good feature is that we can uh, tell the police where the vehicle is, we can track the vehicle. When it's on a straight road, we can actually immobilise the vehicle so it can come to complete stop. It also sets your power modes, your uh, trip computer, your mirror settings, so when you jump in the car, it's exactly how you last left the motor vehicle. And if it's handling performance that revs your engine, how does naught to 100 in 5.1 seconds sound? Uh, the HSV Club Sport is bang for your bucks one of the best vehicles on the market. What we deliver with this particular vehicle is a lot of power with the car. It develops 297 kilowatts, has a massive 530 newton metres of torque. For your enthusiast out there on the market, it delivers a great upper rev threshold, but at your lower rev threshold, it really gives you that low down torque for towing or for all around city driving. Meantime, research and development continues into green cars. Dr Jeff Walker leads the Sustainable Energy Research Group at the University of Queensland. The UQ team's previous successes were with its Sunshark Solar Racing Project that won awards for technical innovation in the 1996 and 1999 World Solar Challenge races from Darwin to Adelaide. The team, the team I suppose, was frustrated that we weren't seeing the technology from the from solar racing move into mainstream vehicles and we saw there was a way that we could do that and and that was by building a car as a demonstrator and so the, the concept of the ultra commuter was born. With some donated parts, funding from the university and the RACQ pitching in to help pay to produce the body of the vehicle, you're looking at cutting edge technology. The ultra commuter differs from conventional cars in that it's very lightweight and very low drag. Uh, it's only about 650 kilos, which is a third the weight of uh, large family uh, cars like the Falcon and the Commodore and certainly um, uh, a four-wheel drive. It's also very low drag, very slippery through the air and its tyres, um, very low rolling resistance as it rolls down the road. Those are elements that were very much borrowed from what we learned from the Sun Shark because it needed those elements to go as far and as fast as it does only on the power of the sun. There's actually an electric motor embedded inside each of the two rear wheels. This spinning part supports three rotating rings of magnets with the windings in between them. And then the, the entire lot is then inside this carbon fibre casing to give it protection. And then that sits inside the 17 inch mag wheels on the car. Because the car's lightweight and yet still has a reasonable amount of power, we'll get good performance, which gives the car credibility we're aiming for 0 to 100 in about 8 seconds, which is much the same as what a Falcon or a Commodore can achieve. 
If you'd like to know more about the Ultra Commuter, it'll be on display as part of the Bulldust to Bitumen and Beyond exhibition. Be forewarned, this could be your car of the future. In any case, at, at the very least, I know, I'm sure we'll see elements of the technology from the Ultra Commuter start to appear in conventional cars, which won't be so conventional anymore. From about 40 vehicles in 1905 to more than three and a half million on Queensland's roads today, we've come a long way since the horseless carriage. Sure, we'll have environmental, logistical and safety challenges ahead, but the car has become entrenched as an important part of Queensland's way of life. Who knows what it'll look like, where it'll take us in the next 100 years. But let's hope that people who are driving cars still retain that same passion for the romance and freedom of driving. And let's hope the next generation of car drivers will have fond memories of that first ride.